It is, and sixth graders at two local schools are camping on Palomar Mountain this week. For 60 years, it's been a tradition for San Diego School District sixth graders to come to Camp Palomar. This video was provided by the school district. Student campers spent four days and three nights learning about nature, the mountains, and how to get along with other people. As part of today's observances, Mr. Obama called for a National Day of Service in honor of Dr. King. Volunteers throughout San Diego County took to the streets in response and took pledges to keep the spirit going on a year-round basis. We have a snapshot from our Chief Pettis. And here's the background. Congress designated the King holiday as a National Day of Volunteer Service back in 1994. Since then, it's mustered hundreds of thousands of Americans from all walks of life to give back to their communities in countless ways. Well, here's one we counted in our midst today. My daughter saw me looking at a flyer last night about this and wanted to come out, so here we are. How important is this? Um, as important as getting the whole country involved with getting back on track, which I would do, I think. <laughs> at a time when government at all levels is cash-strapped and desperate, if not demoralized, it seems to be up to we the people to take up peaceful arms in community service. In this case, grammar students and trash bags to clear a 16-block area of City Heights. Together we can make our city better and our nation better, and it takes us coming out on a day like today to really send that message not into the president, uh, Obama, as he goes in the office, that the people are with him. And he was with the people at a shelter for homeless teenagers in Washington, D.C., climbing a ladder to take down curtains and painting an entire wall himself. That tone of volunteerism echoed off the bulkheads of the USS Midway Museum here in San Diego, where giving back was the spirit of a rally honoring military veterans. We don't have the luxury of not engaging volunteers in our community. I, I think that's, that's going to be part of our solution, and, and that's what we need to do together. And finding that task can be its own reward. It feels so good to give back to the community, and it starts sort of a cycle of, of uh, I don't know, good well-being towards one another which is really important. It's what we need right now. That's the spirit. Well, the City Heights cleanup is organized by the San Diego Imperial County Labor Council. It brought out dozens of volunteers. And if you would like to take part in community service going forward, check out our website, NBCSanDiego.com, and enter volunteer in the search box. Right. This is 10 News Live at 5. Local elementary school students participated in a march today in honor of slain civil rights leader Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., Approximately 2,000 students from throughout the San Diego Unified School District met at Knox Elementary today in Lincoln Park. They marched for more than a mile around the community. The event started 32 years ago and is meant to help children learn about Dr. King's legacy. And then you bring children of all backgrounds from different parts of the city. You bring kids from north of eight, south of eight, east of eight, and all the various directions. So this is inspiring for kids to get together and to just, you know, be with one another, to learn from one another. Students also honored Monique Palmer, a 17-year-old high school student who was shot and killed in Valencia Park last month. The pictures, the stories, well, Sean, we are at Fulton Elementary inside Mrs. Hoffman and Ms. Herman's sixth grade class, and I have to ask the students, what did you guys think about the inauguration ceremony? <laughs> All right. A good, a good reaction from a tough crowd. Now, Fulton Elementary gathered for a special assembly today honoring the inauguration of President Barack Obama. <laughs> Dozens of students participated this morning singing the national anthem other and other inspirational songs and holding up signs and photos of Barack Obama. Students were chosen to speak about their feelings on the ceremony and what they hoped for from the new president. If you put your mind to it, you can accomplish what you want to. One thing I know for sure is that he's an idol to me. The school step team also stepped for Obama. We talked to some students about the festivities who told us what they thought about Barack Obama and what they know about our new president. That President Obama is going to be our president today. I know that he's our 44th president, and this year his grandma just died, and he has, his wife's name is Michelle, 
he has two daughters, and that his two daughters' favorite um, Disney Channel show is Hannah Montana, and that he was born in Hawaii. I feel great because this is like, because I'm, this is the first year I get to see an African American president. The world would be a better place because he's going to be the president now. And I'm with the two speakers who were featured during today's assembly. This is Jared Reyes. Jared, you made a really inspirational speech, but what does Barack Obama, how does he inspire you? He inspires me by, he kept on going. He kept on driving for, he wanted, for what he wanted to be. Well, it came all the way from racism, where certain races didn't have the choice. They didn't have certain priorities as the other race, and that's what's very inspiring. Wow, very good answer. And I'm also joined now by Winta. And you told me um, that you were very proud about the fact that he's the first African-American president. What does that mean to you? Um, it means to me um, because we always had the same race of a president over and over again, but this time Barack Obama comes and then he changes that and he changes history. All right, good answer. Very eloquent speakers we have. Right now we are joined by the school's principal. This is Caroline King. I know that you had all of the classes watch the inauguration speech. Why did you have that happen? I thought it was very important that every student from preschool all the way up to our seventh graders was able to share this opportunity of a historical moment and time. This is something that they will always remember, that they were part of history in the making, and that our students have studied what it is uh, to be a leader and to see such a phenomenal leader such as Barack Obama today to share this historical moment in time was just a wonderful time for all of us, the teachers, the staff, the community members. It was just awesome. All right. Thank you so much. And Dan and Michelle, you heard from the students and a lot of other people from the school. Of course, a lot of these students are very young. They don't necessarily understand the gravity of this moment, but I know later on they are definitely going to realize they really witnessed history today. Yeah, Rekha, you know, you and the principal, in fact, just touched on a really great point. There are few landmark events in life where we get to say, I remember where I was when, and today is absolutely one of those days, and a story that these children that you just talked to will be able to tell their children, I remember where I was when Barack Obama became President of the United States. That's right, and boy, will, will that be a story to tell. <laughs> All right, Rekha, thanks, thanks so Rekha. much. Well, many people are watching history unfold at the Malcolm X Library downtown. They're celebrating every hour until 11 o'clock tonight. Many people say they are excited about Obama's presidency. They hope he'll bring equal rights, employment opportunities, and new beginnings. Today is like a new birth. It's a new day. It's an incredible day. It's hard to believe that it has come. I think it's the greatest day we've had, aside from the birth of this nation itself. At Scripps Ranch High School, students and teachers gathered together to watch the extraordinary event. President Obama has inspired many people and is reaching the youth of America. This makes me proud to be youth in America. Like, it's something that I can relate to, and it's something that I feel really powerful for. And I think that with the change, it's an honor to be a part of this country now. It seems like those buzzwords, hope, and change that Obama has uttered are on everyone's lips from coast to coast. It's most accurate forecast. This is News 8 at 5. No doubt the inauguration of President Barack Obama is a great moment in history.
<laughs> Will all board members please come up front, please? Thank you. Good morning, and I want to thank each and every one of you for coming out this morning, joining us. I know it's a beautiful day outside, and we have some very important things to do, so I'm glad you took the time from your schedule to actually come and join us this morning for our Saturday session concerning our budget. I would ask that you please stand now and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, yes. I just want to let you know, um, <laughs> I, I will be here until uh, the 10, and I'll be, I'll be back at 10 but if you have Thank you. We'll have to wrap it around that time. Okay, the 30-minute window. Thank you. Um, if I would, um, <clears throat> next thing I would like to, to mention is that we have a number of speakers, um, and because they just received them and they're not all, uh, I'll start with the first speaker, and some of you I may have to shorten. I just, are any of these on the same topic or just a mixture of topics for these? It's a mixture of topics, okay, very good. Um, board members, we'll, since we have one item on the agenda budget, we'll do the public comments first, and then we get into our budget discussion. The first speaker up this morning is Anne Marie Perry, followed by Dr. Ken Druck, followed by Paul Gerard, followed by <laughs> Brianna Ray Schumann. Good morning. Good morning. Hello. My name is Anne Marie Perry. I live at 445 La Crosse Avenue. I'm an elementary school teacher with 20 years experience. My daughter is a fourth grader at Cadman Elementary. I'm going to begin by addressing my comments to a phone call I received several weeks ago. Dr. Greer left me a voicemail promising me that although city schools would be making many cuts, the children would not be affected. Almost immediately afterwards, I learned of the proposal to close Cadman. I asked my daughter for her thoughts. She said, Mom, this is the first time I've left school. Mr. Bach, my friends, Mrs. McCabe, everyone is just so mom, or nice. <laughs> mom, <laughs> that could be too. <laughs> could you try and help? That is why I'm here today. You see, my child will be affected by your decision. We had tried choicing out for previous grades. We found schools that did a good job teaching to the test, but not teaching to the student who was taking the test. This year was going to be our last chance at trying city schools. And what did we find? Cadman, a gem. An incredible atmosphere from the principal, to the classroom teacher, to the PTA president, to the custodians. Kendall has gone from wanting to be homeschooled to wanting to graduate fifth grade with her friends. She went from being a disinterested, average student to a thriving, highly advanced one. I know how rare it is to find a school that can balance educational goals with a nourishing, positive atmosphere. Why not build upon it or at least investigate other options? I've kept my promise to my daughter. My question to the board is, will you keep your promise to her? I'm going to conclude with a bit of advice from my dad. 20 years ago when I began teaching, I encountered my first major conflict. My father, an elementary school principal, said to me, Anne Marie, just remember, as educators, your first and primary obligation is to your students. My dad, now a retired school principal, would advise all of you to do the same. As you carefully deliberate on how to make your $40 million cuts, just remember who we're all here for, the students. Thank you. Thank you. 
Dr. Ken Druck, followed by Paul Gerard, followed by Brenna Schumann, followed by Bob Dingman. Thank you very, very much for a few moments of your time this morning. I know you have a full agenda, so I'll be very brief. I am one of uh, many, many people in the community just wanting to get up on your radar screen and tell you what you already know. And it's in regard to all the counseling and guidance programs. Uh, I represent a nonprofit. I founded a, a program in this community. There are so many nonprofits like us who could not exist without your school counseling programs. Erlene Dunbar and her whole crew are phenomenal people. They are the front line. We, don't, we all know the pressure the kids are feeling. We know the suicide risk elements with the economy and everything that's going on are up. We know that you are our front line of screening and early identification. We know the kids are hurting. We, I'm not telling you anything any, but any of us don't know. But I just want to be that voice that says, let's please, let's please keep all those resources alive and well and available to our kids. Let's catch these things early. Let's continue to give counseling and guidance all the support. I know the community is a thousand percent behind them, but please uh, be a voice advocating them with us as well, as I know you already are. Thank you very much. Thank you. I can get on with you. Good morning. My name is Paul Gerard. I live in uh, Del Cerro. Uh, I represent the uh, Pacific Coast Harmony, the chorus of the La Jolla chapter of the Barbershop Harmony Society, also known as the Society for the Preservation and Encouragement of Barbershop Quartet Singing in America, Incorporated. Now you know why it's short, been shortened to Barbershop Harmony Society. Um, I am the Youth and Harmony Chairman for my chapter, and I am also the Youth and Harmony Coordinator for San Diego County. About three years ago, uh, Karen Childers Evans from VAPA um, asked us what we could do to attract more boys to choir. Um, <coughs> we believe that Barbershop Harmony is an excellent tool to do that. <coughs> uh, Barbershop Harmony is a very American art form, and uh, sadly it's not represented in any curriculum that I've been able to find in this county. Um, but it's primarily associated with male singers. You yeah, probably yeah, remember the uh, Buffalo Bills no, that's uh, and, it's, it's and, and that elk. Uh, we aim to convince the boys that singing is a manly, even a macho sport. Okay? It's the way we think we can get more boys into choir. So what we're doing to help is to provide music learning materials and, and coaching to the boys both in the classroom and in, in extracurricular activities. Uh, we're also trying to develop training for teachers and standards-based course materials so that we can actually incorporate this into the curriculum. Uh, we also perform, uh, provide performance opportunities uh, to hone their uh, presentation skills. We're going to have uh, what we call real men sing clinics and uh, young men vocal ensemble showcase that we can highlight that it's, it's young men that we're, we're aiming for. We also have chapter shows and we take high school quartets to uh, high school quartet contests. But all this is a drop in the bucket compared to you know, your budget. We don't really have a lot of resources, but we're uh, trying to help where we can. We believe arts are essential to the, uh, not just a well-rounded, but to an effective education. We need to maintain the balance of arts teachers in the schools. You may hear many people say that arts enable students to learn smarter. We really believe that. Uh, studies find that connections between the brain uh, hemispheres are more numerous. Uh, as I pondered what to say today, I, I realized that really good art requires you to get in touch with your emotions and at the same time do a technical skill. So I, I think that supports the idea that we're, we're built that way. Uh, so I believe that that skill enhances all other learning. Arts are essential. Thank you. Thank you. Brianna Schumann, followed by Bob Dingman, followed by Bill Eco, and then Julie Greathouse. Hi. Um, 
My name is Brian Ray Shuckman. I live in Del Cerro. I had four children go through the San Diego Public Schools. I saw the children are born with various talents to nurture and give their gifts to the world. Their education depends on nurturing their God-given talent, whatever that is for the joy of all. I believe in the 1950s and 60s at least, education was the first responsibility of state government. Now it's been thrown on the scrap heap. Our state government is broken. I wish our boards of ed could strike against this foolhardy mess. I don't know quite what the next step is. This cutting and dicing is scaring and depriving, not just you, <laughs> but children and families and teachers and threatens the future of all and the nation itself. As you work over the budget, I hope you will keep teaching what we as a people, as a society, as a city, want more of now and always. Make sure the children can learn the skills that make the world a better place. Think of 20 years from now. A great city full of the arts always thrives in commerce, excites people, adds joy to the world and all its inhabitants. Reading, writing, and math are like hammers and levels and saws. They're tools, not an end in themselves. Nobody's drawn to your city to see tools except for a hardware convention. But people are drawn to the city, full of the work of educated, schooled, and trained architects and painters and composers and singers and bands and glass blowers and actors and costumers and interior designers and scores more skilled and trained people. It takes over 300 people to put on an opera, plus 100 musicians. You must hold these skills sacred. Please always think how the world will be in 20 years if you fail the children who were born to share a talent in the world for the pleasure of others, not just themselves. Peaceful pursuits are the treasures that you mine. Thank you. Thank you. Bob Dingman. Followed by Bob Eco, followed by Judy Greyhouse, followed by Camille Harris, followed by Angela Bartolome. President Jackson, before Cheryl starts the uh, the timing on me, let me uh, make a, a few opening remarks because some of the members of the board are meeting me for the first time and I, it's my pleasure to appear before you. Uh, first of all, I'm Bob Dingman. Uh, I reside at 10292 Aviary Drive at San Diego, and I'm here representing my community of Scripps Ranch. Uh, as you can tell by my, my shirt, I have a very unique privilege in the San Diego Unified School District in that I have a school named after me and I'm not even yet dead. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's uh, one of the pleasures of my life that I've been able to work with the school district and so forth. And so uh, I have the, the representatives from the parents behind me and Bob Ilko will say a few words uh, for the, and Cheryl is passing, passing out my remarks. The one thing I've learned over the years because I'm uh, clinically deaf from war wounds, and that is that uh, it is always better that I put it in writing and then you know exactly what I've said rather than what you think I've said. <laughs> so uh, uh, with, without uh, uh, further ado, uh, Cheryl, you ready, ready to time me? <laughs> Ready, go. <laughs> okay. We are well aware of the daunting tasks that presented you in planning for the use of our severely restricted uh, funding, many times made even more difficult by mandated uh, restrictions. Uh, yet, we want to provide the highest standard of focused uh, attention. With the able guidance of our wonderful principals, terrific faculty, and without doubt, the finest supportive parental uh, group in San Diego, we in, San Diego, we in Scripps Ranch have in our schools achieved the very highest of academic achievements and test scores. We have assisted our teachers and principals by helping to provide the best possible learning atmosphere and support, and we intend to continue to do that as best we can. This is to be, however, we must pro be provided the essential means to do what we, we do. 
We have repeatedly demonstrated in our community that we will step forward as directed by you and provided and provide as much parental assistance and community support as you possibly can get and to achieve superior results for our students. We plan to continue to work to do this as best we can. We have an analysis made uh, uh, before you, uh, which indicates that Scripps Ranch and Marshall Middle School has the lowest. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Cheryl. Has the lowest dollar per student in spending ratio in the district. <laughs> we accept the current downturn in the economy will reduce our ability to help the school district. Yet we we will do what we can. We see some families also seeking alternative educational means which may affect the ADA in the future. In conclusion, we know all the problems that face you. We know the shortage of funds, and we applaud your open meetings such as this, seeking solutions for the best and most equitable distribution of our very limited funds for maximum teaching input. In this vein, we as a community are very mindful of the excellence of the record of achievement which our schools at all levels have achieved. We will try to equal or surpass these as we continue this stream. To, to accomplish this, however, we need a fair and equitable share of available funds and we need our fair allocation of teaching and support positions. In conclusion, we recommend that you accomplish a further review and refinement of your proposed funding allocations to ensure that we are provided the funds and means to achieve the teaching goals of the district. We think your goals are proper, proper. we support them. With your help and with our efforts, we will, the students will achieve what they need and that is the finest education that is possible to be given in America. And. As I conclude this, I'd say God bless America and God bless all of our work for our students and our children because it's very obvious our country needs all the help it can get. Without further ado, Bob Elko. School board, Bob. Dingman and I and our parent volunteers are here to represent our six public elementary schools which and the schools committee which is made up of administrators, uh, parent PTSAs, two planning groups, rec council, 12,000 homeowners home and about a hundred and hundreds and hundreds of students that come from all parts of the district to our schools. So the eight of us here today represent a much larger group out there. We agree with the comments being made by other parents and uh, we don't want necessarily want to repeat. But the charts and graphs that we gave you today aren't asking for an equal uh, equalization of funds, but we are trying to illustrate that further budget cuts will have a greater impact on our schools. Over the last couple years, schools and scripts have continued to improve academically. About four years ago, we instituted the Scripps Competes program to improve the attractiveness of our schools over private schools. This year, we have seen tangible results that parents are increasingly preferring our local public schools. But with the inevitable budget cuts, there has been an immediate negative reversal of the gains that we have achieved. One of the questions that you may not hear today is how could President Obama's stimulus package in, uh, come to rescue the school district's budget for this year? And when could it come and how, how could it be applied to save our schools, our teachers, and continue to do all the things that the, uh, the school district needs to do and not lose the parent support and the community support? Thank you very much. Thank you. Do any members of the board want to ask uh, questions of the of the parents here? Uh, one thing, as you probably know, I have no children in the school. I have no grandchildren in the school, but I have three great grandchildren that are coming along, and they'll soon be in your school district. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much, Mr. Dingman. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much for giving okay. me a little okay. extra time. Okay. Julie Greathouse, followed by Camille Harris, followed by. Angela Bartolome, followed by Sarah Crum. Hello. Hi. 
Since 2001, I have been involved in the VAPA program as a site embedded staff development person uh, who trains first grade teachers in how to deliver music education without me. This is designed to work artists in your programs out of your budget, and yet our program is set for giant funding cuts. There's only two of us who work in first grade music throughout your whole district, and you book me as booked as I can get. I book up in, by the end of August, I would normally have been booked all the way through June of the next year, and there's only two of us and the other one took a half year off last year for maternity. Providing more cuts in that program would be catastrophic. And, and the program that I'm involved in is designed to reduce your budget by not having music teachers everywhere involved. I can tell you that there is not a school that I have taught in, and I teach not only in your district, but I teach in National City, Lakeside, Lemon Grove, and South Bay U Union. Not one school that I have ever been to have I ever walked away from without at least two teachers saying to me, this has been such an incredible experience. My kids won't miss school the day you come. My kids will be there if they're sick because they don't wanna miss music. They don't wanna miss Miss Julie showing up in their classroom. And I can tell you with all honesty that it enriches my life so much to see the light bulbs go on in those heads. Now my program has been cut from its initial form of 30 weeks per year of in-classroom presentation of lessons and then having the teachers teach them without me in a gradual re release of responsibility program. Then it was 20 weeks. Then it was 12 weeks. This year it's 10 weeks. How much more can you go before you remove the opportunity for children to experience this in their classroom and an opportunity for staff enrichment for your teachers? And believe me, I walk into those schools and I don't have a full set of cooperation from those teachers. They look at me and they say, do you know what I have to do every day? Do you know what the district demands of me? I don't want your program in my room. But by the time I leave, their minds have been totally changed. And I don't think I've ever had one school so far in all the time that I've been doing this that that hasn't been the case because they see the improvement in their children's academic scores, in their reading, in their speaking, in their presence. They see the improvement in their attendance. And all I can say to you is that the reduction in categorical funds that helps to supply artists in the classroom is gonna be catastrophic to the total effect that you wanna have on your students. I, I, I brought some signs, and I'm gonna hold them up because I know my time is up, because I really want you to read it. It talks about the rates of attendance in schools with arts programs, 93% as opposed to 84.9. It also talks about um, the higher graduation, 90% higher graduate as opposed to 72.9% in those that have arts education. And finally, just John F. Kennedy, the life of the arts, far from being an interruption, <laughs> a distraction in the life of the nation is close to the center of a nation's purpose and is a test to the quality of a nation's civilization. Please don't cut the arts. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Camille Harris. And I'm a native of San Diego, and I'm a district counselor, had half contract, working at three different sites for the inner city schools. I'm here in support of my fellow counselors and the teachers and the administrators at my schools and other schools here in San Diego. Um, point one I want I want to discuss is just the current dis uh, conditions with the kids at the school and the teachers. The teachers are overworked, and as a counselor, I see where I can come in and support these students and whether they're having behavior, behavioral, academic, or social problems or familial issues. issues. Um, point two, in response to these conditions, the teachers come to us and ask for assistance to support their students, to help them so they can succeed and take the test that they're required in the elementary school level. Uh, we address the academic, the emotional, social, and uh, students that have language issues, 
familial basic need, living conditions, single parent families, and so I'm talking to parents, I'm talking to students, and I'm talking to teachers. Teachers come and sit in my office and talk to me and talk about their day and help and ask for my help as a counselor. Point three, there's only so much that can be done, be done in one day, and I'm at three sites. Um, when I'm there, I address the needs, I devise a plan to assist the students, be it referral for resources or individual counseling, but I try and find what helps and works for each student and the teacher and the staff at um, the schools I'm at. Lastly, where do we go from here? Uh, you know these child are our future. As a school counselor, I see each child can excel and be their best and reach their learning potential. I've worked with high school students as well, and I see what happens when it's not addressed in the primary school levels. I've worked with charter school kids, and they're in the schools, and they cannot read. They cannot read, they have come to school with low credits, and um, it's a real struggle. Their issues need to be addressed early on, which is in the primary school levels, the elementary school level. We are responsible for this. We cannot, should not, allow our young people to fail. Each child should be provided with the opportunity to go on to college. We need to address the issues in the primary grades. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Angela Bartholomew, followed by Sarah Crumbs, followed by Heidi Delgado, and Heather Sebasti. Good morning. Good morning. Sorry. My name is Angela Bartolome and I live in Del Cerro. I'm a parent of a kindergartner at Hearst Elementary. I'm going to be the first of several people here today that's going to be talking about the proposal with regards to starting or changing the school start time from 7.50 Tardy Bell to 7.20 a.m. Tardy Bell. And um, my particular part in this is I'm a working mom. And uh, as a working parent, I'm, I'm actually going to be representing all the working parents at Hearst Elementary with regards to this. Um, this is actually going to increase costs with regards to the after school care program that we have at Hearst. Um, that's the SAE program. Uh, what that's going to incur is um, additional, additional costs for across the board for the year and then also with the potential of um, an AM program. Uh, right now, I don't think there is an AM program, but if school's going to start earlier, most likely that means that they'll have to open that up and we'll have to pay for that as well. So um, I just hope that you guys will take that into consideration when you uh, look at this proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sandra Kroom, and first I want to apologize. I sent an email and said you were all the site council. <laughs> And um, so I apologize for that. I have a letter here from a parent um, of a child that does get bused to our school. And he says, as a father of a kindergartner, I am very troubled by the possibility that school may start 30 minutes earlier. Currently, I have to have my son in bed by 7 p.m. each weeknight just to make sure that he gets enough sleep and able to wake up in the morning. He has to get ready for school and catch the bus, which comes to pick him up at least an hour before the current ringing of the tardy bell. At times, if there are delays with the bus's arrival time, traffic, schedule, whatever, my son would have to, would not have time enough to eat breakfast at school. Uh, my son is my legacy, our future. Please do not change the start time. This will hinder our children's development and future. Of course, as a parent, I am willing to make any and all necessary sacrifices for my son's well-being, but we should exhaust all alter alternative options before deciding such a drastic change, which will directly hurt our children. Please vote against the changing of the school start time. Um, I've sent an email to the superintendent uh, address and asking how changing the bell time to 720 um, saves us $1.2 million. I, I haven't received an answer and, and you know, I, I don't know if I deserve one. I think I do. Um, consolidation of bus schedules does make sense. You save money with that. What I don't understand is how starting school at 720 mm -hmm. works into that and saves the $1.2 million. Um, I, I don't know. Um, we don't want it. <laughs> it's hard on the kids right now. You know, 7.50, my son is an early morning kid, and by Friday, he, he wakes up and he's tired, and, and I tell him, you know, it's Friday, we get to sleep in tomorrow. And so now we're looking at, you know, I get him up right now between 6.30 and quarter to 7, and we're talking about getting him up between 6 and 6.15 in order to get him out of the house at 7 a.m., and I just don't see how that benefits him. Um, and so just please think about that. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. 
My name is Kevin Delgado. I'm speaking okay. for my wife, Heidi Thank Feldman. Uh, I live at 5432 Siesta Drive in uh, the college area. And I have a kindergartner at um, Hearst Elementary as well and a preschooler who will be going there very soon. And I would like to reiterate, um, speaking against the earlier start times for all the, all the reasons you've just heard, we're very concerned um, that our already sleepy child will be even more sleepy and more fatigued. Um, we're concerned about families who are working, who are squeezed at both ends of the schedule. We're also a choice uh, family. We choiced into going to Hearst, and so we have a slightly longer commute, and I'd like to speak to that. I know there are many. Um, the choice program really serves a lot of families very, very well, but the extra commute times are, are really going to be pressed. A half hour might not sound like much, but getting everyone to work into school on time um, in, in, through a, lar a longer commute is very, very difficult. Um, we're concerned about the extra childcare time that we're going to need to see if we don't get off work any earlier, but our school um, is going to be letting out earlier. Um, I'm also a professor of music at San Diego State University, and I'd like to reiterate all the wonderful things that were uh, said this morning, speaking out in defense of the arts not just as a util utilitarian tool to improve test scores, but just sort of at the core of who we are as, as people and as citizens of this country. Um, I guess I would be, rem I'm speaking out now as an individual. Um, I've given you um, sort of lines in the sand for my family are uh, against the start, early start times, against cutting the arts, against cutting counseling. So speaking as an individual now, where would I make the cuts? What would I suggest to you? Um, I would really hate to see class sizes increase, but the one student proposal that I saw, if I had to swallow it temporarily, we, we, I could live with that. I would, uh, would not wish higher medical co-pays on anyone, but um, the medical plan I have through the CSU, I wind up, we've wound up paying 10 to $15 per visit. I can certainly see a little room if uh, going up $5 on a copay. Um, with, with all due apologies to people that that would affect. Um, I would also suggest if need be, cutting the more expensive extra extracurricular sports um, activities and things of that nature. Um, landscaping, I just don't want to see the, the, I don't want to see teachers, counselors, the arts cut, and I would not like to see earlier start times. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Heather Shabad, Shabay Stari, is that almost close to right? <laughs> Hi, my name is Heather Shadastari and I'm a parent of Hearst Elementary School. I grew up in Del Cerro. I went to Hearst, and I can tell you that I remember going to kindergarten and we had rest time. We had nap time. And now, with the earlier start time of 7.20 in the morning, with a longer time in school than when I went, that we actually got to rest and feed our brains, um, that it's going to cause um, a lot of problems in the home as well as in the school. I live in Del Cerro. We have a horrible, horrible parking situation at Hearst. There's nowhere to park. So when you drive to Hearst, I live up the hill. It should take me a matter of five minutes to get my child to school, and it doesn't. You park far away, you get out of your car, and you walk, okay? so. An earlier start time of 30 minutes is actually more like 45 minutes. Now, my kindergartner is not a morning person, as well as many other parents who could not get here today. I know by the end of the day, my son is extremely tired, extremely tired. Now, I don't know how the performance in the classroom will be uh, with an earlier start time, but I can tell you that it probably would diminish because most kids at 6 and 30 in the morning, when they would have to eat breakfast, don't eat. My five-year-old doesn't want to eat breakfast. I force him to eat one or two bites. Now, they do have snack time, but it's still that two, three hour period in the morning when they're supposed to be listening to their teacher and learning, their brain is not thriving. I also note that on your website, your website, 
it states that there's mounting medical evidence that the amount of sleep, time of day, and the circadian rhythms play a part in how prepared students are in the classroom. I don't understand why our schools have to have an earlier start time because board of members, the bus excuse schedule. Excuse me just a minute, board members, please. This lady speaking to us, and there's two conversations going on up oh. here. And we're trying to solve the problem. I'm I, very sorry. We apologize. understand that. We understand sorry. that, but please. Um, I also know that many students will probably be more tardy due to getting up earlier, parents trying to get the kids out of the house, the parking situation, um, absences might go up. I know that the schools will lose money if that takes into effect as well. Um, it, it just doesn't make sense. I know that my husband gets home from work around 6, 6.15 at night. There are many other parents that get home later. I know that I would have to get my son in bed between 7.15 and 7.30. Thank you. Please continue. Please finish. Um, the, also, we're having our time of day switch today, tonight at 12.01 a.m. Now, it's 7 o'clock at night. It's sunny outside. I don't know if your child will go to sleep when it's sunny outside, but mine won't. The sun is out. It's not my time. The sun once doesn't go down until about 7.15, 7.20 around, just starting to go down once the time changes. We have to take that into consideration. I don't think all the parents want to go buy blackout shades for their children's rooms <laughs> because that's really what will have to happen. We don't go to bed at 7 o'clock at night. I don't think most of the kids will go to bed at 7 o'clock at night. It's just not normal. And we need about 10 to 12 hours of sleep per day, per child, to have their brains develop. Please take that into consideration. The 30 minutes, I know, doesn't sound like a lot, but it really, really is. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes our public testimony. Superintendent, would you like to go over the um, presentation of our numbers and then I open it up to board member comments. I just want to comment on the testimony. Uh, no. Thank you, President Jackson. <coughs> and I apologize for my cold. I think that uh, James has made me sick here. <coughs> he says, he laughs, he says, I made him sick for the last three weeks. Oh, so. <laughs> we don't do blame up here, okay? Oh, no blame. Too. No blame game. John wants to know why he's sick, too. I think it hasn't been the uh, last three months. Our staff and I would like to just quickly go back over the numbers that we shared with you during our last meeting. Uh, we provided you with an impact study of, of, of the categorical cuts that we placed. <coughs> we'll tell you that as we continue to try to work through these numbers, it's very frustrating for us. We know it's equally frustrating for you. Um, Dr. Morris just came up here and told me a few minutes ago that we have yet received additional word from Sacramento that because of the lobbying efforts on behalf of some, that now the governor is saying that they are going to uh, change their <coughs> flexibility pattern and versus giving us flexibility in, in all but 43 categories, now they're going to move that back up to 48. So, our, excuse me, 38. It's down, down to 38. 38. So we are, they've, they've shrunk the, the, the flexibility pool. So we're scrambling around to see uh, how much that has impacted us. And we don't think it will be much, but it, it, it will be some. So we just, we just want you to know that we're working hard. I apologize that when we come in, you've got one number one week, the next time it may be a little different. But that's gonna continue to happen until after the June revise when we get that. So <clears throat> I'm gonna turn it over to James. He's gonna walk us through this. Uh, we're gonna answer any questions that, that you might have. And can I ask the board members to write questions down until the presentation is done? Yeah, Thank can I you. ask also, somebody's got the air conditioning on. I don't think that we really need it today. Somebody can turn that off. I thought it was just me. <laughs> you think it's just... <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, there's cold air somewhere. <coughs> Thank you, President Jackson. Uh, what we wanted to do is just touch base really quickly for 2008-9 and remind everyone the gap that we were trying to solve, which is listed on slide 10 up on your screen, that shows 14.6 uh, million 
and then another additional 800,000, getting us to about $15.4 million. And based on our last board meeting we had with you folks and under your recommendations, uh, you asked us to prepare essentially uh, inc impact statements for each one of the items that we had listed on, would you move to slide 11, Cheryl? Yeah, for each of the items that you had we had listed on slide 11. And you should have been have received 10 additional pieces of information here, and they start off with uh, the first balance of 2.5 million. And so over the past several days, what we had done is work with Chuck Morris, our deputy superintendent, to really uh, sit down and work with the program managers and the people that manage the program so we could understand the full impacts of that. We also have uh, Debbie Foster here today, and Debbie is our subject matter expert with categoricals. So I'm gonna ask Chuck and Debbie to come on up so we can walk through uh, the slides that we have. And then Debbie, before you get started, can you please, um, let's just walk on, come on up, and let's just walk through the formats as far as the call page you've got. Cheryl, if you could move to, um, the first one that's called Art and Music Block Grant. You should have that in a PDF file. Right. And then Debbie, what I'd like you to do first is just walk us through the column heading so everybody understands uh, the 0708 ending fund balance all the way to the right, okay? okay. So if you could start with that. Good morning. Uh, starting out with the first page should be arts and music block grant, the one that we receive uh, this year and it's scheduled to be ongoing. Uh, column A uh, reflects, as the board had requested, what the ending balances were last year. So we put that as a reference for you for 0708. Uh, new funding that's either anticipated or we have confirmation that we'll be receiving uh, before the reductions was the 1.9 in column B. Um, we have an adjusted column there for you in column C that incorporates the carryover and the new money. Um, then we've put the impact of, as we knew it last night, um, the 15.38 and as um, Dr. Greer mentioned, numbers are changing and information is changing, but based on last night, that's the information we had. Um, we pulled information from the financial system on uh, February 28th, that's reflected <coughs> in column E. Uh, we do know that there's a lot of activity outside the system. Uh, schools are still using uh, categorical for hourly and other activities that may not have been posted yet. So those are the balances that were actually posted and incurred on that date. Um, column F would reflect, based on analysis of working with the program managers, what's truly unobligated as of today. And um, that column F would match the amount on the page 11 in your um, package. Just uh, let just me just give you just a quick point of reference. Uh, the one thing we've also been doing is based on the, spend, the, the freeze that you folks instituted for us, what we've been doing is uh, getting actual spending plans from that date forward to the end. And so part of the work we've been doing the past several days is just matching that up to make sure that they haven't spent more than we think they were going to and to make sure that these numbers that you have on the page are legitimate numbers. Go ahead. Then just as a reference, uh, column G and H are what are budgeted positions. For most of these programs, they don't have positions, but if there are positions referenced, the balance in column E and F reflect after every salary is um, taken into account. So those balances would not impact monthly personnel, which is the reason for that statement right below the numbers. Then we worked uh, very closely with uh, Mr. Morris, and to his staff question. about the program impacts and that's reflected in use and impact. So Debbie, let me just ask a clarifying question for us. So when I get to uh, column G and H, and in the first slide we see uh, one, so um, is that one FTE? Help me just help the board understand what that really means for us. Okay, yes, that's um, just one FTE. That could be possibly two uh, half-time people, but the total amount that's budgeted <coughs> is one um, FTE under the classified category. Okay, thanks. But again, these uh, impacts would not uh, affect those people in those positions. And so again, maybe it would be helpful is versus our staff sitting here and taking time reading because everyone can read, you've had this material, just to see if there's a question about this because as you can see, uh, the impact, no impact anticipated. So if, unless you have a question with this first one, we would like to just move on to the second. Yeah, I've got a question with this yes. first one. Okay. And, and, and if I can clarify again, I think for the board, if you look at column E that says budget balance, yes. 
all of these have taken into account, and I'm going to repeat this, any salaries that have been encumbered for now in the rest of the year so that no personnel is affected once you get to that Thank point. Thank you. Mr. Hamara. Yes. Okay. I, I, when we say salaries in this particular, I just want the board to, because you're going to get hit with this later. Um, when we say salaries, you mean salaries of any San Diego Unified personnel who are on our books as employees, do you not? That's correct. Okay, so we are talking about visiting artists, and um, this is not the visiting artists program. Uh, let's see here, teacher training projects, VAPA instruction, setting arts and da, 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 da. we don't have any visiting artists, teaching artists projects. <coughs> So if we do have a contract with that individual and it's encumbered, it would already be taken out of this amount. If it's not in a contract form and encumbered, it would still be um, an expense that we would still pay if we... So there, for business. example, I believe um, there's an artist from the zoo who goes out and visits the schools. There's the artists throughout this community who, you, who are paid with these funds. And if, if they're under contract for the rest of this year, then that's been taken into account. Okay, because I can tell you that that's an important source of income for the artist community, particularly as the economy falters. But, um, you know, I, so people are going to be losing income from this. Okay. Okay, I have a question, and just clarification here. Um, at the top of this, um, it says resource name, it says ongoing, but in the use it says a one-time allocation. So I guess my, my question would be that even though we might take funds from this this year, next year they would be receiving some funds, even though it would be um, having a, uh, a reduction because of the deficit. Actually, what we did on all of these is we have been given permission to use the 07, um, 08 in balances to balance our budgets. So if that's the reason these particular funds are being used because they did have some balances. I understand that McLean. <coughs> but the answer, the, qu answer the question is this, that is that while these are ongoing block grant dollars, right. we can use the, the year end fund balance to balance the budget mid year. Then this account next year will get, <coughs> will get less money. It will be cut by 20%. So, okay. so that we, we can sweep up any of the funds mm -hmm. in this account mm -hmm. that are, have not, that doesn't go for salaries, that have not been encumbered, that were just there. And you can see, for example, last year we had a carryover $3,600 that were not spent. <coughs> so that's been traditional. The key is next year you won't have, it's a double hit next year. You won't have the carryover because you're spending it to balance the budget. Okay. And <coughs> it's gonna take a 20% hit from the state. Okay, so, so I, that's why I'm asking that question. Right. So when I look at column B, if I was <coughs> to want to think about how much we would receive for the 9-10 budget, it would be 20% less than the amount in column B. Is that a fair statement? Correct. Okay. I just want to make sure that we're not That's saying, because at the bottom here, it says that it means a reduction in carrier, which is okay, but it would negative, but the bottom line is that we still would receive some funding next year. Now, on the next page, and, and I know we just doing it one time, it just says, at the top it says one time. So that means that, that, that was a one-time block grant. Good. There will be no additional funding for that. Okay, and year. I just want to make sure that we're clarifying that in some of these cases, it's not ongoing. The ones that are ongoing, I think we should, you know, for, for right. me to help me in the future understand that we will put a, a, a decrease of 20% of the amount in column B to help us plan for next year. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, Mr. Barrera, then Dr. Evans. Yeah, so I'm trying to understand how the uh, how we're how we're implementing the freeze. I mean, I, I think the um, the direction from the board was uh, to to freeze spending, uh, and then uh, spending. You know that uh, a school would argue it needs to make would have to be approved basically by the superintendent. Correct. That's the that's that's, that's what we're living under. Okay. So so in understanding that. Um, the column E budget balances of the end of February, and then column a F av adjusted available balance. H how is it that 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 the balance went down 
you know, by that amount between the end of February and now? We working with the program manager or the um, principals, knowing that they already had obligations that were outstanding, we took into consideration any of those items. And, and I think it's important. Th in those are things that were already committed to, contracts already mm -hmm. signed, right. people mm -hmm. already doing the work. Okay. <coughs> and, and quite frankly, uh, as you know, just you ask, yeah. so, so basically what happens is you go in and if a principal has spent money but hasn't posted and it hasn't come in, uh, we had to go in and say, get caught back up. Mm -hmm. And that's another thing that we're working on is as you encumber money, we have to have a different system where as you encumber it, the school, it shows up on your accounts here. Okay, so just in terms of the timing of these conversations with the school sites, uh, am I understanding correctly that what you've done is you've gone to each individual school site, you know, in each of these uh, uh, funding sources, and said, how much are you gonna need to spend between now and the end of the year? Th that's the conversation that's been occurring? Well, what we actually did is uh, we instituted the spending freeze, right? Yeah. And then let me just talk a little bit about the lag of information. And so uh, it takes us about 14 days in the new month to essentially kind of do a soft close on the books. Mm -hmm. That's when we catch everything up. Mm -hmm. So what you're seeing here in part of this adjusted balance would be encumbered items that we've gone back to schools and or programs that are legitimately encumbered that could be a contract, could be an ICA, uh, those kinds of things. And so what we've done is gone back to schools and program managers to say, uh, what in your encumbrances can we legally eliminate? Mm -hmm. Because there's just some things that we're legally obligated to do. Mm -hmm. And then in conjunction with that, there's a little bit of a timing issue, which is normal in finance, uh, to essentially have some care. The, the actions that we do in the previous month, you, we normally catch up to them, reconcile them in the next month. Right. It takes us about 14, 12, 14, 15 days to do that here at the, here at the district. Uh, so with those two pieces in mind, what we've also done is when we went out and, and said we're gonna institute the spending freeze, we knew there were specific things that <coughs> you couldn't stop spending. I'm mm -hmm. sure you folks got a lot of emails saying, mm -hmm. you know, I have copy paper, mm -hmm. I have bus, you know, school bus trips to take, those kinds of things. So in working with the school principals and the budget analysts and the budget team, what we tried to do is say, all right, in the freeze that we have in place, what are the items that you have to do to carry on business? Mm -hmm. And so the things that we're gonna keep doing is you're gonna have to keep student safety, health, uh, materials, paper, uh, janitorial supplies, those kinds of things. So we've actually sat down with almost every principal so far and looked at their spending uh, items that they have. And if they had anything unrestricted, we pretty much said, well, we're gonna eliminate that based on the spending freeze. So we walked through each area of funding that they had at each school site and have, uh, based on our, sp our spending freeze criteria, have said, you can keep spending that, no, you can't spend that. That's been a lot of work and it's probably still a little bit ongoing of some reconciliation right now. So that's how we've been managing that. Every day we sit down with the principal, have a phone call, send an email back and forth talking about what they plan to spend and what they don't. And then what Terry has done is he has given the authority to myself and Chuck to approve those items. So uh, Terry and I, on a, or Chuck and I, on a two times per week basis, we go through literally each one of those forms. Mm -hmm. And we either approve or disapprove, and then we send it back to the school chief improvement officer to say this has been approved, and here's why. It fit under health, it fit under emergency, it fit under, under materials or we don't approve it, and here are the reasons why we don't approve it. Mm -hmm. The other real quick thing, and I know that <coughs> you know this, you look at $1,700 on the next page, and you go back up here, <coughs> excuse me, and you got $2,500. Just, just as a reminder, when you look at over 186 schools, you're literally talking $50 here and $100 there. What you're talking about doing is sweeping these accounts, and there's right. not a lot of money left at each one of these school sites. It's not like we're going in and taking $5,000 away from a school mm -hmm. or $2,000 away from a school. This is after we have swept up accounts, and when you guys ask us to go back and look at this, we didn't mind doing it, but I wanted you to know when you, you, you look at this, it's a little bit at this school and a little bit at that school, and you know that. <clears throat> but we are trying to, at the same time, be as frugal as we know how. Right. What we've also seen is since uh, the board has put this freeze in, we have had a flurry 
from principals of coming in and saying, well, well we, we gotta have this, we gotta have this, we gotta have this, and as Chuck and James have said, if, if it's something that's legitimate because you said to us, right. if it impacts teaching and learning, right. okay. Right. If it doesn't, so, so that's that's really what I'm trying to get at, and it's going to be with all of these um, right. these categories. Uh, I guess the question is, have we completed the process of you know having the conversation with each school, um, where you know they're identifying? Look, we have to spend, and, and it's part of what you know, Mr. DeBeck was talking about last week. Schools that had sort of you know planned out spending over the course of the year that haven't spent it yet. So are we, are we done with the conversations, I guess is the question where schools can say, I understand the spending freeze, but we had in our game plan that we were gonna spend X dollars in April on something that does impact you know, uh, you know, student learning. Uh, are, are, are those conversations over now? Yeah. Or is there still, you know, so in other words, if we approve, you know, sort of sweeping this 2.5 from this and, and all the rest. Yes. Yeah. It, okay, so yeah. that's, that's my yeah. question. So yeah. when you look at the 10 slides that we have, yeah. uh, one of the first things we did is we make sure we collected all the different uh, spending request forms that they gave us to find out, to ensure that we could take the dollars that we have listed here. So I'm, I'm looking at the art, music, and PE one time, the 1.7. We confirm that based on school site conversations that we can take those dollars that that's not in their current spending. And I'm not just talking about that we can legally take the dollars, no, no. but the sort, yeah, right, the conversation, no, no. yeah, but I'm yeah. not talking about the legality, I'm talking right. about operationally. Okay, Yeah. okay. So we, we ended up extending the time frame just a little bit for them because we'd never asked them to do this before. Yeah. So it was a lot of work on their part to get this all accomplished. Okay. And I'm talking mainly the principals at the school sites. Okay. Okay, Dr. Ergen. Yeah. Dr. Evans. Okay, my comments were very much in line with what Mr. Barrera said, so I just want to make sure, because when we're looking at a two, uh, the $2.5 million cut, we want to know, you know, what is the uh, impact. And from what I understand, um, things ongoing and uh, things that were planned are already covered. And so when it lists things down here, like construction material supplies and so forth, it would mean, one impact would mean if, I suppose, if a teacher in April came up with an idea of buying some new music or doing something like that, that those new things would, even though they might be good, would not be able to be added on. That's correct. So that would be one impact in terms of, not that things would be cut off that were already planned, but new things couldn't be added on. And then the other reality is we just have to be aware that we're really cutting to the bone and we're not gonna be able to do this again because we've cut out the carryover for next year and we have less, less next year, so right. that's just another reality, but it is a way to get us through the year by keeping the ongoing programs going and not eliminating the people who are working on them. That's, that's correct. correct. Yes, okay. sir. That's correct. Laurie, any more comments or questions? Um, <coughs> yeah, well, I still reserve, you know, questions about, I, what's interesting to me, and I guess what's making me suspicious is that what you've got on your hard copy piece of paper says this was a one-time allocation to the district of which the $1.6 million balance remaining is at the school sites. The purpose of the grant is support funding for VAPA-related instructional material supplies, musical instruments, professional development, et cetera, which sounds pretty bloodless. Um, and then, but the one I've got up here on, the, on this says the art and music block grant is an ongoing grant that funds the teaching artist project training classroom teachers to provide VAPA instruction at the elementary grades, the grade level arts experience project for all grade two through eight students, giving the opportunities to attend performances and exhibits at the local arts venues and content area, textbooks and supplies, musical instruments and music materials that doesn't sound like anything that I really wanna cut. Um, you know, so, well, I, it, it's not me, it's whoever wrote this, um, thank you for this. This is, it really reminds me of when I worked at an environmental impact, um, and there was a thing for San Onofre plant, and this young guy wrote it, and it, it, all the animals that were going to be killed by what they were doing, and then his boss came in and cleaned it up, and it sounded a lot less damaging. So, oh, we, we, you know, I mean, this is the board, need, board needs to know. It, it is, can I just comment really yeah. quickly on that? And, and, and certainly, I, I think it has been stated that 
the amount that we're taking is not going to change anything that has already been planned for this school year. Do they have gone back time and time again to confirm what the spending for this school year is and that is being that, that is okay. The amount that is being taken is the amount that was not allocated, didn't have any encumbrance as of the um, 28th of February. So, and I think Dr. Evans' point was absolutely, you know, correct, that if someone comes now to a school site or to the VAPA office and say, can I come and do this particular program for your district this year, the answer is no. no. Whereas in the past, they might have come, you know, um, around March or April or Mother's Day to do something special we could have said yes. So I think that that is, that is the, the, what, what is happening. So we're, we're not cutting anything that has already been planned. What we're saying is that we won't spend any more money. I the other, other part of that that That's I right. think that we under, well, but that, but that is exactly what, the, what, what this is saying because the difference, and I, I point again out to the difference between column E and column F. And when the question was, why is that such a huge difference, that is because we have protected the arts programs for the rest of the year. We just can't add any more to it. Is that correct? That, that's correct. I mean, what the encumbered items, those things under contract, are not being cut. Now, I will say to you, a principal may have made something verbally to somebody to take place in April that we are not aware of, but Anything well, for that example, yeah, for example, there are, you know, kids go to see the symphony. You don't pay for those tickets, you know, six months in advance. And, you know, or kids are going to, you know, right. go but see the, a program. But by the but same time, was, whatever we know about. But by the same time, if that principal would have said to James or Chuck or to me that we're going to the symphony in April and we need to do, we need X amount of dollars to do that, we said, fine, we, that's in keeping with what you have directed us to do. Now, again, <clears throat> I, I, this is very frustrating work for us. I know it's equally frustrating to you. We've got to balance this budget at the end, the middle of this year, and, and we have said to everyone, uh, we have worked hard to keep this away from our children. We continue to work hard. But for, for anyone in this community to think that we cut $53 million out of this budget at the beginning of the school year, now another 46 in mid-year, and probably over 140 for the next school year. These are painful cuts, and, and we're gonna work just as hard as we can, but, but we have spent an inordinate amount of time this week doing what you ask us to do, meeting with principals individually. Now, if somebody has come up and they have, have for whatever reason, forgotten to forecast, and, and they <clears throat> have traditionally gone to the symphony, and, and they, oh, I, I forgot, that's a whole different story. I mean, they have been given every opportunity. And, and what we said to principals is, we're not just asking you, go ask your leadership team in your school, talk to your teachers. We need to know what you've encumbered and what you've got planned. And, and if, it, if it fell within the guidelines, which you were very clear about, uh, and you said you didn't want, did not want this to impact kids' education, uh, I promise you, we're, we're passionate about this stuff as you are. But if there's money available that has not been encumbered, and look at the carryover that we've had for, for every year. I mean, last year there was a $6 million fund balance. And I would ask the same question you might ask about, that's why. But it is what it is. And, and, and so we're looking at right now, at the end of the day, you would have had a $1.7 million fund balance. But that's that one seven at one one point seven. So if if people have had an opportunity to to stand up and call for those funds, and if for whatever reason they haven't, then quite frankly, is that's on them. And I would share one other thing. Yes, yes. In this time of year, by this time of the year, we've already planned all of our field trips and they might not have gone home to the parents, but on our school-wide calendar, it has been planned and we have noted that and the allocations are usually, I mean, the staff knows and the, I'm sure the principal knows of any sympathy, any symphony, any of the uh, um, field trips that have been planned that would encumber um, the district. I, I'll, I'll leave it alone after this, but I think a telltale for the board is is that you go through each one of these and you look at the fund in, in 
funding balance in last year and then you look at this year, there's a few of them that is different. But most of them you will see the, the year in that we are sweeping now is significantly less than what you had a year ago. I just want the board to understand what it is that they're cutting. It, it was very striking to me, frankly, that this, as I said, is so bloodless, and this sounds like something I don't want to cut. Um, and I, I, I appreciate knowing what it is I'm putting on the table. I would rather know fully, um, and because it, it's, and this is the very first thing, Dr. Greer. Um, as you know, you know, my family's in the arts community and, you know, and, and many different levels. Um, so for me, this is what, what resonates. Um, although I do want to tell that music teacher out there that kids that need athletics, um, they need it like oxygen too. So um, it is, it's, it, this is difficult, but this is just the first, the first thing. Um, and, you know, there are going to be other things that I care about that are on here. So, but there are going to be other things that I don't, you know, care so terribly much about. Um, and it, it's, uh, I, I would have been remiss not to bring it to my fellow board members' attention. We, we thank you for, for the bringing okay. it to our attention. Right. Uh, board members, any other comments? Uh, superintendent and staff, do you have anything else that you want to share with this? Oh, no, ma'am. Also, I want to say I appreciate. Okay. I do appreciate staff work. I know you've worked hard on this. Well, I, th I think from staff standpoint, I appreciate it too because I think we, we've we've said to you we're going to work hard to be transparent, mm -hmm. and so I think that you and, and we and the whole staff, and the other piece of that is not just being transparent, but this is whole this it's this entire idea of let's try to work together as we go through this, and so reaching out to people to get their feedback and impact. Uh, on this, I think was uh, was important as well. So it is my understanding that you're looking for uh, the board today to uh, make a, a motion and approve the um, additional category flexibility solutions found on page 11. Are, are we going to go through each of these? Each one of these? Yeah. Or? Well, that was his question. His question. His a question. Was there any other questions? Yeah. Okay. On, was any did, on, yes. on any on of them, he was saying that he did, yes. that we received these items um, to review, and we have reviewed them. If you have any questions on any of them, please ask that of the staff now. And then my question to the staff currently is <laughs> today's goal, what is it that you would like to Today's goal is we would like for you to approve this and to approve our mid-year um, plan so that we can. Uh, and this would, this would solve our mid-year plan, the, the $46 million problem. Page 11? Yeah, that's correct. So we'd ask that you would approve that so we can essentially cl uh, close out the 08-2008-2009 uh, year and concentrate on the 2009-10 fiscal year coming up. Okay, so I just want to reiterate this to board members what the staff is asking us, looking at the items that they have forwarded to us in discussions at the previous board meeting and this board meeting <coughs> that we approve the items that are listed on page 10 and on page 11 to close out the 09, 08, 09 that's correct. Yes, budget. Yes, that's correct. The, um, I just want to clarify that. Yes, Barrera? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Did you want to go? Uh, well, I notice on this, the only one that's got a higher ending balance is the, um, in this year, is the, the gate which has, everybody else is the left-hand column is higher That's than right. the right-hand column. That's right, Chuck, do you want to comment on that? In, in terms of, we basically looked at, at what the ending balance was last year based on what was still available, and that was the figure that we said that would be available for this. For but for this every year. other one on this list, their actually their ending balance this year is higher, which would indicate to me that they haven't spent as much. They haven't spent the funds that they. They traditionally they haven't sent the discretionary funds like they have in, in in other places. That's the reason you've seen traditionally that kind of a fund balance and carryover every year. Okay. And this is discretionary with the schools. This does not have anything to do with the personnel. Thank you. Any other questions, board members? Dr. Evans? Okay, I'll, I'll try to go through these very quickly. So I assume on the next one, arts, music, and PE, there's a, there's a big gap between the four and, and the next page. Uh, there's a big gap between the four and a half million and the 1.7 million. And I'm assuming that, and it's a one-time fund, that those had already been encumbered and planned, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And then on the next one, which is pure assistance and review, um, 
in terms of understanding this, I know there's a you know a $500,000 adjusted balance. Um, but when I see words under the use, the mandatory component of the program provides assistance to permanent classroom teachers and so forth, uh, and that the su support is currently provided by full, four full-time consulting teachers. Um, so based on what you've said, this doesn't affect personnel, those four consulting teachers. Actually, in, teachers this, in this one, we will be able to complete everything we're supposed to do for the rest of this year based on what's required of us under law okay. because of the fund balance that was currently there in our current. Oh, program. so we started with 600 and we were supposed to end up with 500 and we could take that down to that, zero. That's correct. That's but we will be able be. to complete everything we're supposed right. to do under the law. So once again, we're doing away with uh, the cushion. That's correct. Okay. And then on the discretionary block grant, that, um, that comes out pretty equally between E and F. And again, same issue in terms of having been encumbered. Let me just go through quickly because there's a couple others. Um, same thing with the gate. Um, I'm wondering on the... Um, can, can, can I just mention yes. the slide you have for gate is incorrect. Okay. The, the document that I have shows an actually ending fund balance for 207 to 208 of 767. So I wanted to point that out, which would put us in line, which then answers the question that was asked about the fund balance. So, so the balance at the beginning and the end is, is about the same about and the we'd same. be clearing that out. And then on the next one, which is instructional gardens, it's relatively speaking a smaller amount. Um, that it, we're talking here about 30 schools have implemented a school garden program, which certainly seems really great from a lot of points of view of science, knowledge, environmental, and so forth. Um, so by, uh, are all these plants gonna die? <laughs> well, I have no to be water. frank with you, some of them haven't been planted yet. Uh, and, and you know, I have to say to you, to show you some of the flexibility, yesterday we received a, a memo from a school that said we're having our planting day today. Yes. We've obligated these funds, so we have, found other ways to try to take care of that since that would already taken care of. I mean. And not only that, I will say, and I, I surely hate to lose money in this category because even this morning as we speak, uh, people are out volunteering and donating to continue uh, some of the gardens and um, out and around the Gompers uh, community. And, and I thank them for doing that. And, and even though this is a small amount as far as our budget is concerned, um, you know, everyone has been, you know, concerned about losing any funding uh, to help our garden program, especially in this particular time when we're going to urban gar gardens is the, the thing that's really taking off in our country right now. Um, but but I, I think that given um, our economic crisis right now, uh, we'll, we'll make that sacrifice. But I want to thank the communities that are stepping up to fill in uh, for doing that. And what we'll say again to the board is, have we had principals that stepped up to us and said, we need this money to buy seeds or plants, we would have released it. I mean, mm -hmm. this is not something, that, none of these are, I mean, we, we've tried to toe the line uh, and because we just have, but we've been very reasonable with with request, simply because we we also support this, and we we got clear. To, you were very clear in your direction to us. So so on this, <coughs> it's not necessarily that these 30 school gardens are going to be eliminated. Right. Um, so and I guess you know. If there were more details, you're saying nobody has requested, set, made a special request. Well, but what we said, Dr. Evans, is up until yesterday, no one had. Right. Yesterday, we came in with about a, a about twenty-one hundred dollars. Twenty-one hundred dollar request from a school uh, to that help with, been spent. With, with the gardens. Well, we'd already frozen this. We prepared this, and so we we tried to find some discretionary money to say, okay, go ahead and do that, and we'll cover that. The and problem and is there's just not a lot of discretionary money to find. And I want to assure the board, and I know Dr. Greer has directed us to do this, 
we're st the, the, the numbers are still coming in from the state. What we will do in all cases where there is a major need for a school, we will make every <coughs> attempt to go in and find how we can do that for emergency purposes and for those things that, that have already been done. So it's not the end that, well, this all, you know, we're gonna make every attempt to work with our schools because schools are where it's, where it's happening. That's, that's right. our goal. That's well, on this one particular one, again, it's relatively a smaller amount, but right. it's very important. Right. And it's a one-time grant. And in terms of the message that we're sending to the community, one of the things we might even consider is even setting aside a, a percentage of this instead of the full, cutting the whole 150, yeah. having some I'm sorry, part of just, it. We don't actually have the number for what was the size of the, I mean, we don't have the adjusted budget in our slide. Was the, was the total grant $159,000? Uh, that's yeah, it's kind of strange. <laughs> this one. That was carryover from a prior year. Okay. So how, do we know how much the? So we don't have anything. Do we know how much the grant was originally, Debbie? It was uh, approximately three hundred thousand. So they started out the year with 300,000 and spent 150? No, no, no last that was, year, at the beginning. Yeah. See, of the, the point grant. is with this, uh, Dr. Evans, this they started out with a, approximately a $300,000 grant. It looks as if they spent about half of it. Uh -huh. And then it, the, in, the grant went away. And that was a one-time grant, uh -huh. and they hadn't spent 159,000. Okay. Okay. So it's been there all year. Okay. And they haven't spent any of it. Okay. And so then the ki kicker is it's sitting there. They haven't spent it. The grant ended last year. The original grant was 300,000. They only spent 141 of it. So the 159 was sitting here and no one asked for it until yesterday we got a request for about $2,100. Okay, and it's not an ongoing no, thing. Sir. It was a one-time thing. So right. quickly on, on the next item, which is the Nel Soto parent involvement. Uh, which is 355,000 and the concern here is that in, in terms of affecting education, this is dealing with at-risk students, uh, home visits. Uh, again, there's just uh, only one figure, so I don't know what there was and what was spent and what's left over, but uh, yes, I'm just wondering if this means that we're gonna stop for the rest of the year working with these at-risk students and then we're gonna have more dropouts. This grant actually was a carryover as well and the grant expired um, in January and we've asked, we had asked for an extension. Uh, schools were having a hard time uh, spending these, these dollars. So we do have an impact statement there, but that's a carryover from a prior year and it was approximately 700,000 to start with. Schools were having a hard time spending money. Well, you got, well, Dr. Evans, you gotta remember, uh, kind of like we talk about our problem when from a, a general fund and a capital fund, uh, there are very stringent and strict limitations that a lot of our grants apply toward us. Mm -hmm. So there's very specific things that essentially we can spend the dollars on. So I could see that it would be difficult in some grants to actually use okay. the dollars. So this is not stopping anything that's already mm -hmm. ongoing or planned like we said on the yeah. other things. Okay. And, and if it was, we would have we would have deducted that out of this. And what you would have seen is, is half of this or Mm -hmm. even more mm -hmm. had that been requested. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because I can promise you, as, as little as it, is, is, as it sounds, getting back to the gardening, you know, mm -hmm. uh, we, we very, I wish every elementary school in our district had its own garden. Yes. And I really do. I do too. And, and so that and along with parent visiting, as I said before, we share your concern and passion about these things. And, and we've gone back and asked two times, yeah. you know, what's, what's going on with this? Yeah. Okay, and one um, final question. In terms of things that are not on all of this list, if we were to come up with other things, and I'll just use an example, I'm not proposing at this point, for example, if we were charging parents fees or something, something came up between now and the end of the year where we were able to either make a cut in this year or get more revenue in this year, could that be then, uh, we, we, we could already have balanced the 2008-9 budget, but we could count that towards uh, our 2009-2010 budget, I correct? Think the, yeah, if I we think find the, additional savings. Yeah, I, I think the year. kicker is, and you're gonna see this later uh, uh, next week when we talk about next year's deficit, 
and when you, when you see what we're talking about, and I don't want to belittle uh, $50,000 here, $100,000 there, you could, you could save $100,000 uh, or $200,000, or you could save $500,000 in fees. And I can promise you that will be a proverbial drop in that bucket and, and you will see that. So we, we will continue to try to scrub and find ways because uh, you know, $5 here and $5 there certainly adds up. We don't want to, to, to right. and I just discount wanna, that. I want to be clear as we're going through during the rest of the year that accounting wise or whatever, that that's how it would work. If that's we find we another way to yeah. save a million dollars right. in well, this school year or raise a million dollars, that we then have another million towards yeah, next year's deficit. Is, that could be added to our ending balance, which then when you get into the new fiscal year, it'll be part of the beginning balance. Right. Good, okay. Mr. Guerrero. So just a couple things. Um, so what we're doing right now is we're we're sweeping to in order to you know balance our budget for this year um, money that otherwise would have been carried over until next year. That's correct. That's basically what we're doing, right? That's correct. Right. So the impact of the loss of these funds that are being carried over is that going to be somewhat um, mitigated by the fact that next year our plan is to fully fund the school budgets? No, almost, uh, yeah, almost all of these, except for several, do not actually involve personnel. Mm -hmm. So it will be affect in terms of money that they might have for materials or supplies, but in terms of personnel, the answer is, it, except in a few couple of these areas, that there will be no effect in terms of personnel. So fully right. funding the budget right. will do that. What, what, the, what, the, what the negative impact's gonna be is that, uh, in years past, the school district has began the budget cycle with what, what they, I guess, called a, a beginning budget balance from carryover from the previous year, like these dollars. Mm -hmm. And so you might start out the year with mm -hmm. $50 million or, or more of carryover. Mm -hmm. Now all of a sudden, you're spending mm -hmm. that money to balance this year's budget, so you're not gonna have that money to carry over, which, will, which widens that gap for next year. Mm -hmm. We in the past as a district have done this for, for, for many years, and just mm -hmm. what's happened to us is when the state comes in and cuts us by 20%, two things happen. Number one, you are not going to have the amount of carryover you had because you've got to balance this year's budget. And then on top of that, you've got a 20% cut in categoricals for the next year. Yeah, I guess my question, and I'm not trying to at all, you know, minimize that this is going to have real impact, but right. my, my understanding of part of the problem uh, from the district underfunding school budgets every year is that it results in uh, school side councils basically needing to, you know, f make cuts in supplies, right. You're right. you know, and, and others. So, so I mean, I, gu I guess that's the question, and, and the fact that we are, you know, intending to fully fund school sites next year. I, I think I understand your uh -huh. question, and so I think that there is going to be a direct relationship yeah. in, in terms of what you're talking about, because if we fully fund yeah. uh, the school sites, then they're not going to have to go back and make cuts, yeah. particularly out of areas where they've had a 20% reduction, yes. which yes. there's nothing there to cut. Yes, yes, exactly. yes. yes. So good that's point. Very good point. The, the second, <coughs> the second um, point, and this came up, I had a great meeting last night with a group of uh, uh, parents at uh, Sherman Elementary, and um, and they were, you know, it, it just the the sort of the spirit of um, trying to, you know, uh, that we're all in this together, you know, <coughs> trying to trying to figure this out. Um, was was really uh, uh, I mean it was just it was it was great to experience one idea that they had and I don't know whether we started to look at this or not is um, doing an inventory of each school to figure out are there supplies materials um, that a school has that it just probably is not going to use next year. And, and, and then looking at schools that need additional you know, supplies and materials and basically sharing. So I'm not talking about money, I'm talking about you know, physical supplies and materials that schools already have. Um, that if one school says, hey, I've got more than I need of whatever it is, um, we can actually sort of put that back into the pot and share that with schools who are gonna have less than they need next uh, year. And to answer your question, two weeks ago, 
we put in place that at the end of the year we would actually be doing an inventory yeah. of every school. Yeah. Part of just as an example, textbooks. We don't know where textbooks are located in the district. Right. We're going to know that so that next year we're not buying textbooks that we don't need when they're sitting here and a school over here needs them. So yeah. that process has already started and, and that inventory yeah, will be we're, taken. Yeah, we're also taking another look at something that I know some of the board members have been asking questions about in summer school. And our summer school programs in, that we're running right now are being fully reimbursed by the state. But here, here's something that we've not given a lot of thought to strategically. We started looking at it yesterday. Uh, we have thousands, I mean thousands of students in this school district that are one to two years older than their peer group. So I'm not, while I'm not advocating social promotion, what I am saying is if you have meaningful summer programs that may cost you a little on the front end in the summer, it's going to save you millions of dollars because think about most of our kids, it's not taking 13 years to educate the ones that stay in. Yeah. It's taking 14 and 15 years to educate them. And so when you add the cost to educate a child for another year or two more years in a budget the size of ours, it's astronomical. And so we have started to take a look at that and we're talking with Daryl about what we could do perhaps using technology, uh, maybe not now, but in the future, that's got to become a more important strategy for us as we look to try to get our budget under control. Okay, th thank you, we'll carry it. 910 discussion, 910. Ms. Nakamura? Yeah, so as we, we are sweeping these budgets, but as far as the budget is concerned that we get from the state next year, absent any decisions we may make later in the day, um, these are mm -hmm. gonna be, you know, restored. We get X amount of money from, or is this just cutting this forever? <coughs> no, what's going on with this is some of these are grants. And some okay. of these, some of these have already expired. Okay. We just talked right. about okay. two we that did. are gone. We did. So yeah. those are gone. For period. Period. Right. Uh, others that happen to be categorical in nature, uh, the, the monies will come back next year, but right. they will come back at 20 percent less than what right. they started this year. Yes, ma'am. Okay. That's. I just wanted to make sure I understood that. But I would also like to uh, remind the board that when we were talking about, um, you know. Uh, uh, doing, you know, making our campaign up in the state legislature. I said that we should, as far as if we were asking for flexibility, that we should ask for, you know, that, that we were gonna identify programs that we didn't want flexibility because the pressure was gonna be on us to cut those programs. And as long as there wasn't any flexibility in there, we wouldn't have that pressure in order to cut those programs. Rob Potter, um, you know, Rob Peter to pay Paul. And this board to a person said, you know, because I mentioned arts and music and I mentioned the gate program, and this board to a person said, oh, we would never cut arts and music and we would never cut gate. When it comes down to it, we will protect those things. Well, we're not. This is it. We're cutting arts and music. We're cutting gate. We're cutting English lang you know, language acquisition. We're cutting all the things we said we weren't going to cut. So I'm putting that out there. We're not protecting them. Dr. Evans. Yeah, I just want to follow up with the comment about uh, summer school because, and I know we're going to discuss the next year later, but first of all, the summer school this summer comes out of the 2008-9 or the 2009-10 budget? Depends on which part of it's in June and which part of it's in July. Oh, okay. So it's by the, it's actually by the fiscal year. Yeah, yes, our, sir. Our fiscal, so, our fiscal year goes July 1 through June 30th of, of the next calendar year. Okay. And some of the summer school is obviously during, yes, during the month of June. And so I know, and I don't have it right here out of my 3,000 emails, but there, you gave me the uh, information on the summer school um, costs, not the most recent one, but uh, one from someone who was in charge of summer school, and there was a figure like six million on one part of it, of which four million was reimbursed, 11 million, six million was reimbursed. So I guess my question is, is could summer school basically be run with the amount that is um, reimbursed by the state only, and, and is there a possibility of using some Title I funds to supplement that without going into general funds. Actually, yeah, that's what we're planning for this year, but Chuck, Chuck will speak to that. Actually, we're, we're putting options together for summer school now, trying to get legal opinions, because one of the things that we want to do is once we get our Title I 
money, the new stimulus money, is to be able to use Title I funding along with our reimbursements to be able to provide summer school basically at no additional dollars out of our general fund. And so we're putting together several different scenarios. It's right now still in the planning stage, but we're, we're getting closer mm -hmm. and, and we're seeking some legal opinions about how we can do this to make a mesh together. And, and are you also looking at technology in terms of reducing uh, the cost of summer school Very too? much so. I've, I've yeah. asked Daryl to, to do a, so that you know, a technology plan that puts, that takes technology into every classroom at the elementary level and at the middle schools in terms of what that cost would be. Can I get a, a motion for these items, please? Yes, want to speak? Are you talking about these? Yes. The categoricals. Just yes. categorical, mm -hmm. do that. Okay, um, yeah, I... Mike. All right, well, you know, when you... My first statement about this is that I want to know whether or not we're planning to borrow the money from these accounts or steal it. Okay, steal. it's steal. like it's yeah. like I got a, a family budget in it. I also have some money for my college education, but yeah, I got to pay my mortgage, so it's pretty important because the family won't have a place to live. What gives my college education for my kids? So I borrowed the money from the account. And do I intend to pay it back or are I just going to eat it? You know, the kids have been doing whatever they did to put the money in the account and I need it so I grab it, okay? Well, it seems to me like we have a moral obligation to decide that if we steal this money, that we're going to say we're sorry first, and then, or we're not going to steal it and we're going to let them have a first chance at getting it back when the money comes in that's in this category. And I'll use an example. The one I was talk talking about is more than one in here, but the Arts and Music Block Grant. Okay, so there's, um, I happen to have been contacted from schools in my area, and they said, yeah, yeah, well, sure, we haven't spent all this money. We, we have a reason because we've been accumulating it for the last few years to try to get enough money together to put a band into our school. Okay, now we could have bought a whole bunch of piccolos and a half a dozen clarinets and a couple of bass drums, but we don't know exactly how many we need until we set up a program. So, you know, if you force us to spend the money, we'll go out, you know, it's too late now because you're going to steal it from us, but if you force us to spend the money, if you set up a policy that every time you get a categorical grant, you're going to steal it if you need the money, then we're going to start buying piccolos. Mm -hmm. And if we have to trade them for violins, we'll do it. And it's a waste of money, but that's your fault because you forced us to spend the money. Okay? Now, and I, I, last time I used the, the grasshopper and the ant story, I didn't finish the story, but everybody knows it, I hope. And so then the issue is these people that are the ants that actually think ahead are penalized because we didn't think ahead. You know? And so, you know, when it comes to this tier three for the uh, arts and music block grant, I'll never vote for any one of these motions unless it says we're borrowing and we plan to pay it back. It's not just a simple budget solution, it's a moral question. Okay? Now, we go to the second page. I'm doing these page by page. The second one is arts and music and PE one time. Okay? I say the same thing. People may want to get some athletic equipment. They may want to do some stuff. They may have had some long-range plans. Somebody could say, oh, yeah, well, well th this wasn't spent. It should have been spent. Well, you know what? You tell that to ants. You know, they should have ate all the food so they, till the winter they all starved. I'm sorry, that's not going to work for me. If I've got people that are better thinkers than we are, out there in the schools anticipating problems and trying to figure out how to run their business, <coughs> why should I say because we can't run our business that we're going to take away their money? No, I'll vote for it if it's a borrow and it's a moral obligation to pay it back as soon as we get money in this category. Now we get to the next question. That's the first part, because if there's a motion to just do it, I'm gonna vote no, I'll just tell you that, and I'll be the minority, but I still believe I got a moral standing of what I'm saying. The next piece is, these are categorical funds. 
They're not supposed to be used to solve general fund problems. If I get money from the state for arts and music, I can't use it for something else because the money came to us for a reason. It's, it, you know, they, they could say flexibility, but flexibility, you know, will they give us another grant if every time we send it down here we steal it? I wouldn't. Uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, a lot of people send money to places expecting they'll be matching money, people using, you know, other kinds of support for it. And when there's evidence that every time they send it down to us, we, cho we choose to grab it and use it to solve general fund problems, I think we're, I'd be reluctant to send us the money, frankly. So I think we're in a moral bind here about trying to figure out what to do about categorical, sweep the categoricals, take away counseling money because the counselors don't need it because they didn't spend it already. Well, I'm sorry, but you know, thinking ahead is not a bad thing. So uh, if you're talking about these, this, this exhibit, okay. Now we'll go to back to the John and the summer school. When we ask a question and that's about a round about a budget, and John asked the question, maybe it wasn't as focused as staff would like it. They answered his question, but they didn't answer anything we could use. Because here we get the answer of how much does it cost for summer school? Well, we get reimbursed two ninety seven per hour per kid. Is that worth $10 million? This whole report thing here, I went through it and I couldn't find the dollar amount for either year. Okay, so then let's say that I, there's a, t I already made it up on my amount, and so far nobody's refuted it. I've always been pretty close and asked guys in the budget how close I am. Okay, and I said $10 million for summer school, and I didn't say which fund it came from. But if you cut summer school, no matter which year it is, this year, you're gonna say, unless they can prove me wrong, $10 million. Well, I think we've got a shortfall somewhere, don't we? And so if the five of it comes out of this year and five year comes out of it next year, so be it. But if it's at 295 an hour, so what? That doesn't matter. This is it. For a manager, that doesn't matter. The details are the way you con us. You don't want to do it, say, we don't want to tell you. We don't want to save money on summer school because we don't want to touch summer school. Okay, how much for, P, for uh, athletics? Nobody wants to cut athletics, except, guess what? The stellar char uh, charter schools around us and, the, and a lot of the private schools don't have an athletics program. And they get waiting lists. Preuss, no athletics program. Pretty doggone good school. A lot of people would like their kids to go there. Point Loma High School got got PE, they, but they're paying money for it. We are. Okay, then you go down the hill a little ways, and they're all complaining <laughs> in Point Loma about the about high tech high and high tech complex. They don't have a football team. They don't. They got all that money in their bank, or they're using it for instructional programs. So what's more important? You know, if we say our backs to the wall, and I thank you guys for pushing the staff to comb the for the for the fluff in the thing, but it won't get us 80 million bucks. It's good you did it, but we're still stuck with a lot of money that we're behind. But I can entertain shutting down summer school. I can entertain shutting down PE. Athletics is for a special group of kids. And if I match that up against, let's say, Palomar Mountain, sixth grade camp, which is for everyone, it's no choice for me at all. Or if I do it for music, and I, for a district-wide music program, sorry, athletics, you know, that's a part of it. I don't know music's special, but it ought to be for every kid. Because the evidence shows that music does more for academic achievement than athletics does. Just prove me, I don't mind. But you know what, it's a, you, you, we're gonna take a blow when we go back to our areas if somebody, like I, you know, my people in Point Loma are gonna say, oh, you took away our football team. Yeah, yeah, I had to because I was forced into it by a bad planning of a state that can't handle educational funding. And if you want me to do away with Palomar Camp instead, that's not gonna happen in my vote, but let's vote for somebody else next time. 
because I'm doing what I think is the best thing for the community as a whole, not what's politically right. Now, there are other things, and you know, I've, I've already been through this ROTC battle. It costs us about, you know, somewhere in the range of $2 million, I may be off, you know, a couple hundred thousand. $2 million to offer ROTC in our schools. It's a special group. So John, I may interrupt you. Well, let me finish. Okay, because we want to focus on that. You know what? Part. I'm focusing on the issues. I'm, okay. There may be some you haven't yet uh, come up with, but I'm going to tell you when it, if you're talking Did only you? about this, mm -hmm. this sweeping these accounts, I already said my piece. Okay. But if I'm talking about what the agenda item is, which is budget reductions. For the mid-year, we're going to do 9, 10 at a different session, John. All right, but let's okay. talk about that. You know what? Well, let's do the 0, 0, 8, right. 9 I'm, first. Okay. You interrupted me. I'm going to finish my thought then anyway. Thank you. All right. Every time we get into this ROTC discussion, we get this thing, oh, you got to tell the federal government about it. So now is the time to tell them for next year. See, we can't cut ROTC this year. It's not a solution. We've already kind of halfway so solved our 08, 09 with all the cuts we've made, basically, but the big, big hit is next year. The big, big deficit problem, the big, big report to the state through the county is a problem, and the truth of the matter is I don't think we've got a solution, and I'm saying if you've got to make budget cuts and you've got to talk about this year and the notification that's required to get yourself out of a pickle next year, you better start putting everything on the table, not just somebody's pet projects or a few things that people don't like, because this is a crisis and we've got to realize it. Now, if we left it up, oh, site decision making? The money that you guys are talking about here, this is the stuff that, is, that currently they want to talk about, the, all the categoricals. The reason why it wasn't spent was because sites decided not to do it. So when do we decide that they get to not decide things? Today. Sorry. Okay, go ahead. Okay, I'll call for the question. Okay, but there wasn't a motion yet. I just want to make a couple of comments to follow up on, on, on Mr. DeBeck. I think we haven't heard this from the staff, but I mean, if there are situations in which people at sites were not spending their money and saving it because they have a five-year plan or they do want to put in something in their school, um, that would be good to know about because when we're asking about what is this $15 million going to do, we're asking what, what, is the, what is the effect now and what is the effect the long term and we're willing to face that as long as we know what that is and I think when in the issue of borrowing versus just taking it, if we, even if we have to do this, if we at least know, okay, this is what would have been done with these accumulated funds over the next few years and we're going to have to make a note of that in terms of we need to you know what, eventually I could, restore. I, I couldn't agree with you more, but I think right now this is not the run-of-the-mill school year. This is not the run-of-the-mill, maybe short-term deficit. We are in an economic crisis, and, 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 and I understand what Mr. DeBeck is saying, and, and, and certainly people in their households, in their households are making these same decisions. They can't say to their kids that they use their students or their children's money to pay their mortgage rather than have money later on for them to go to college. I'm gonna make sure I'm gonna give it back to you because many of them don't even think they have a job to give it back to them. They don't know if they even have their house next year. What they do know is that for right now, we can stay in our homes if we use the money that we have in our savings or our investments or whatever is left. I understand this is difficult. I understand that we don't want to touch certain programs and everything in this district is important. But the most important thing that we can do right now is ensure that our students are in school each and every day. That is the most important thing that we can do. Now they may, in, as, in this particular year now, what we're saying is we're not cutting any of the arts that have been planned for this year, as seem to be keep getting indicated. We're not cutting any of any of the major programs that have been funded this year. They're all still in place. In addition to that, we're not losing any staff. And as I sit here, 
and and I've been listening to districts up and down this state that has cut staff this year, that has cut programs this year, and we're sitting here at the second largest district saying our focus is on our children, keeping our children in school, so we're willing to look at what we have left over, maybe from whatever reason, grants or whatever to use for this particular year. Now, there is no doubt that as we go into our 9-10 budget, the conversation may be a little bit different, but right now, I think we need to focus as a board on the rest of this school year, our 08 and 09 budget, and, 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 and deal with that issue and the consequences of that and how it relates to uh, the 9-10 budget. But I want to make it, I think we all need to recognize very clearly that we are not in business as usual format. This this is not the annual just get the budget together and get it approved. We, we, we are in economic crisis, not only here, but throughout our nation and our state. And there are people, not, I'm not for my peers here, but there are people who don't believe this is real. And it is real. It is. You look at our Wall Street, it is real. So we need to be looking at what we can do to make sure that we as a board, protect what we say is most important. And I think the most important thing, we love our programs, every single one of them, but we do not need to have children on the street because we are closing our schools. We do not need to have children on the street because we do not have teachers in our schools. We do not need to have children on the street. We prefer to have programs <coughs> rather than providing seats for our students. So, you know, we don't have a motion on this item. But we do need to have a motion on this, and we do need to have a second, and we either need to vote it up or vote it down, and then continue on our discussion, please. Uh, I'm, I'm prepared to move to that in just one second. I just wanted, since Mr. DeBeck wasn't here when we discussed the summer school issue, and I agree that the, the amounts per hour and so forth did not answer the questions that we were looking at, but the thing that did answer the question was looking at fundings, this, which is not on this list here, but the kind of the intent of the board, at least from my point of view, should be to fund it, whatever we do for summer school, to fund it through uh, state reimbursed money, through Title I, through improved uh, technology, and to somehow keep it going uh, that way. Okay. Yeah, I'd like, to, I'd like to add on this, that um, you know, we I just sent out a budget survey to parents, the single highest category for never consider is one that 63% of the parents that responded said visual and performing arts programs, never consider 63%. Athletics, ninth and 12th grade sports, 66% said never consider. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm, these are the, the two highest, out of everything that the parents responded to, this was the most resounding, don't do it, that we got. Um, but that's what's on the table right now. I, can I make one comment? The state is taking 15% of our categorical dollars this year. That's about James 20 million dollars. Yeah, 15.38% uh, to be exact. So they're, they're taking dollars. that money. And, and, and the issue is, is for instance, in TIG, that amounts to almost $12 million. We can't take and cut $12 million out of TIG because we've used that money to backfill in our schools to have appropriate staff. So I only want to say to you that that it's the state who has is, who is made the decision on the categoricals and, and that we're trying to do the best we've got with the money so that it doesn't affect. And I, I think uh, President Jackson's correct. The, the reality, I met with every principal yesterday in the district in three different meetings. All of them understand we're in a crisis. They all understand we're gonna sweep every balance at the end of this year in order to be able to help next year in any way possible we can do that. Does anybody wanna do that? No. Do we wanna do it? No. But they understand it. They understand the crisis. Now, do they still say I need this and that and they'll try to, to get anything they can? Absolutely right. That's what we hire them as principals to do for their schools and their kids. They understand where we are. They understand the sacrifices are gonna have to be made. Well, I'd like to say that, you know, we've been through this before, Mr. Morris, and sometimes our priorities shake out differently. 
I don't think anybody could ever accuse me of not taking this financial crisis that we've been in seriously. And there will not be children on the street. That's an overly dramatic statement that really sends chills through. It's not a matter of children on the street. It's a matter of prioritizing the educational program. And I don't agree with these priorities. Okay, I, uh, I'm trying to make a motion to just first want to say that, make clear that there's nothing on this that is discontinuing arts and music programs that are going on through this year. There's nothing on here that is discontinuing athletic programs through throughout the year and so forth. We are just taking some uh, difficult decisions about money that are on these funds to balance our budget for the remainder of the year. So uh, I move that we uh, accept these, uh, the recommendations of staff on these um, particular items on page 11. Second. It's been motion and second. Any more discussions or comments? If not, please yeah. vote. Oh, John. Okay. Um, the, you know, it's interesting to see us work in, uh, I'll call it, to try and come up with a one-year solution to a two-year problem. So, you know, you, you, you can anticipate that money's gonna come back in these categories, but then are you gonna sweep it before it ever gets to them? <coughs> or are you going to allow them to have this money back that we took? Or are you gonna just take it forever until we come out of a budget crisis? And yeah, I agree. This question about kids being put on the street is absolutely wrong. If we cut personnel, we wouldn't be putting kids on the street. We're not cutting personnel. In fact, what you're doing is you're taking categorical money to help you with a personnel problem. Because some of you pledged that you were never gonna make cuts uh, in personnel. But the truth of the matter is you're gonna be back to the wall and have to do it for next year anyway. And the argument will be if you're gonna be, uh, if you're gonna look at two years of budget, you better look at two years of budget and not one, and then say, oh, okay, we solved that problem. You know what, when we file our, our report on March 15th to the county, our second annual report, uh, and ask for, they're gonna look at two years, that's automatic. They actually look at three. But we're, we're saying, oh, well, we solved this year's budget problem, and that, that gets us out of the hook. But the truth of the matter is what you don't do about this year will affect the ending balance and the, will affect next year. And so if you don't make any drastic cuts out of this year's budget, you're going to have those deficits are going to be riding on next year's problem. So, you know, don't want to do it. Okay, uh, you want to take categoricals? That's okay. There'll be somewhere. There's going to be some legal challenge. I'll bet uh, somebody's going to say, you know what? You you diverted that money to a place it shouldn't be. And uh, you know, if if the money the categories were cut, uh, you can't anticipate them coming back. If this money is only budgeted money, then it should never been in those accounts anyway. But people said this is carryover from last year. Isn't it? So it's not this year's money at all. It isn't this year's money, but you're solving this year's money on last year's carryover. Eh, iffy. Um, and I don't, I don't think it's the right solution. I think there's a, lo a lot of better solutions that the board's trying to avoid. So I probably won't vote for it. Vote. That passes 3-2. Thank you. All right. I think we're now going to adjourn to closed session. Thank you for coming out today, and thank you, staff, for your dedicated work. We'll reconvene upstairs in about five minutes to closed session, board members. Okay.